In this video, we're going to talk about the Saha equation for photoionization. So photoionization is the process by which a photon comes in and strikes a neutral atom, for example hydrogen, and knocks off one of the electrons. So that we end up with an ion over here. In the case of hydrogen, this might be just a single proton, but in a general atom, this might be an ion. And separately, we have the electron here moving off with some velocity, potentially v. So this is photoionization. It's the ionization of an atom with photons. Now the Saha equation answers the question of, in thermal equilibrium, what is the ratio of atoms in a neutral state? So we'll talk about perhaps the number density of atoms in a neutral state compared to the number density of atoms in an ionized state. So in other words, what is the fractional ionization of atoms in thermal equilibrium? And the answer to this is the Saha equation. Now when we're talking about thermal equilibrium and the populations in different states, a natural starting place is the Boltzmann equation, which says that the number density in a higher energy state compared to the number density in a lower energy state is just related by the degeneracies of those two states, these g factors, times e to the minus the energy difference between these two states, e, uh, divided by kt. And we've solved this Boltzmann equation before for bound states of atoms like hydrogen. Now the thing that makes photoionization tricky and why the Saha equation isn't totally trivial is because there are actually a lot of different states that are all lumped under the heading of an ionized state N+. For example, once we've ionized an atom, we now have a continuum of velocities that this electron could be moving at. So counting degeneracies becomes a bit more tricky. So because counting states is the tricky part of solving for photoionization, I'm going to simplify the problem first. I'm going to write in green to show that I'm considering just a special case. So in green here, I'm going to consider only the ground state of the neutral atom. So whenever I write N0 in green, it's understood that that means the number density of atoms in the ground state, the lowest energy level. And now I need to consider what ionization state I can end up in. And because there's a whole continuum of ionization states with different velocities for the ejected electron, my Boltzmann equation becomes a differential number of ions for a particular velocity of the ejected electron. And I'm comparing that to the number density of neutral atoms where I'm going to remind you one more time that this green N0 means that we're in the ground state. And now we know from Boltzmann statistics that this is going to be associated with whatever the degeneracy G is associated with this differential ionized state compared to the degeneracy of the ground state times e to the minus energy over kT. Now what do I mean by energy? Well on the left side of this photoionization interaction, the energy is bound up in this hydrogen atom, E equals H nu. But after ionization, the energy is in two places. One portion of the energy went into the binding energy of that electron to this ion. So I'll use chi here to, re to represent the binding energy. So this is just the potential energy required to take an electron in orbit around an ion and move it off to infinity. And the other portion of that energy is in the kinetic energy of this electron, which was 1 half me v squared. So when I write energy here, the energy here was chi, the ionization potential, along with the kinetic energy of that electron, all over kT. So obviously one of the keys here is going to be to calculate g. So g, you remember, is the degeneracy of the ionized state, which means it's the product of all the different states of an ion times all the different states of that electron. So remember that for GE, the degeneracy factor for an electron, we're asking how many different states are there for an electron moving at velocity v. Now we've done something like this before for a Maxwellian distribution. It turns out the degeneracy of an electron is given by the number of spin states of an electron, which is 2, times some differential piece of volume that we're looking at, times the number of different momentum states an electron could have at this energy, all over h cubed. 
So what this equation for the degeneracy is saying is that because electrons are fermions, you can't have two electrons in the same state. So for wherever an electron is, this little piece of volume where there's an electron, dV, where capital V is the volume, every electron in that box must either have a different spin state or a different momentum state. And we divide by h cubed here because of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, you'll remember, says that our uncertainty in a spatial coordinate, let's say x, times our uncertainty in a momentum coordinate, p sub x, so momentum in that same x direction, has to be at least h. So what this does is it tells us a minimum scale for considering states to be independent of one another. So if we're isolated to within a certain volume, a little delta x, delta y, delta z, here, then we can measure the different momentum states, delta px, delta py, and delta pz, in units of h along each of those three dimensions, and we've counted up the number of different states that there are for an electron to be in. So this volume, dv, is the volume assigned to one electron. So if we want to express things in terms of number density, it's one over the number density of electrons. And then the number of different momentum states that have the same velocity, well because velocity or momentum can point in any direction in three dimensions, the number of different velocity states is given by 4 pi v squared dv. So that's the area of a surface of radius v times some differential thickness in the magnitude of your velocity, dv. But we needed the momentum in the x, y, and z directions, not just the velocity. So for each of the x, y, and z directions, we needed to multiply by the mass of the electron for each of the dimensions, so me cubed. So rewriting our Boltzmann equation for the ground state, we end up with the differential number of ions at a given velocity v relative to the number of atoms in the ground state is equal to 8 pi me cubed over h cubed times g plus over ne g0 e to the minus chi minus 1 half mev squared over kt times our last v squared dv factor from our degeneracy. So this is where we are so far going from a ground state to a state with an electron velocity of v. But now we'd like to do all the different velocities that we could end up with. We would like to integrate over velocity v. So when we integrate over v, we'll get the total number density of ions up here. But we have to integrate all the terms that have v in them on the right hand side here, which are this term right here and our v squared dv. So if we do a change of variables here to take x to be the square root of me over 2kt times v, then our equation becomes n plus over n0 is equal to 8 pi me cubed over h cubed g plus over number density of electrons times g0. And I'll isolate the part of the exponential that has the ionization potential in it over here, minus chi over kt. And now with our change of variables, we get a factor of 2kt over me to the 3 halves times the integral over x over the full range, going from 0 to infinity of what ends up being e to the minus x squared times x squared dx. Now, it turns out this integral has a closed form that you can just look up. It comes out to be pi to the 1 half over 4. So when we substitute that in, and I'm going to go ahead and move our number density of electrons up over here, I get that the number density of ions times the number density of electrons over the number density of neutral atoms in a ground state is equal to 2 pi me kt over h squared to the 3 halves, where I've lumped all my constants together, times 2 g plus over g0, where I've factored the 2 back out to remind us that this 2 came from the number of spin states of our electron, e to the minus chi over kt. Now this equation right here is sometimes called Saha's equation, but we should remember we're still in green here. This is just for the ground state. If we want to generalize from the ground state to an atom or ion that's in any excitation state, then we need to translate the number density of neutral atoms in a ground state to the number density of neutral atoms in any state. 
And it turns out that's given by Boltzmann's law again, G0, over a general partition function of neutral atoms as a function of T. Because the number of different states that are available to a neutral atom depends on what temperature those atoms are at, how many different excited states they have available to them. And similarly, we were only considering the ionized state ending in the ground ionization state. But in general, we could end in any number of excited ionization states as well. So we have to consider the ratio of the ground ionization state to the total number of ionization states it could be in. And similarly, that ratio is given by the ratio of G plus that we've been carrying around to a general partition function of an ionization state, which again can depend on temperature because that decides how many different excitation states are available. So the full Saha equation then generalized away from the ground state is that n plus ne over n, where we're no longer requiring that these be ground states, is equal to 2u plus the partition function of the ion over the partition function of the neutral atom times a constant that depends on temperature, 2 pi me kt over h squared, all to the 3 halves power, times the ionization potential, e to the minus chi over kt. And this right here is the full Saha equation. So let's take an example of the Saha equation just to show how it works in practice. If we consider neutral hydrogen, the ionization potential of neutral hydrogen we know is 13.6 electron volts. So if you just naively plug that into here and asked at what temperature does that exponent of E become unity, you get a temperature of about 100,000 Kelvin. So you might expect that after the Big Bang, when the universe was composed of a bunch of protons and electrons in a plasma that was gradually cooling down as the universe expanded, you might expect, incorrectly, that the universe would become neutral, which is to say that it recombined, when the temperature of the universe was around 100,000 Kelvin. But this is incorrect, because what you didn't pay attention to were these degeneracy factors. Because ionized hydrogen is just a single proton, and a proton just has two spin states associated with it. So its degeneracy factor is of order 2. Whereas for neutral hydrogen, we get a partition function that is the sum of all the different energy states of hydrogen times the degeneracy of that state times the probability of its occupation. So e to the minus i over kt. So if we take this to be a high temperature where approximately all states are populated equally, this becomes the sum over all the different electron orbitals, two spin states for the electron times two spin states for the proton times all of the different angular momentum states of the electron orbital, which is 2n plus 1. So this becomes of order 4 times n max squared. So this becomes very interesting. This says that the temperature at which the universe became neutral depends on exactly what the maximum orbital of an electron going around a proton is. Now you know the energy states of a hydrogen atom start out far apart, but as it gets more and more excited, we get more and more states that asymptote to a continuum. And so this question of what is the maximum n is a little strange, because mathematically we say that this is an infinite series. But in practice, if your electron is orbiting too far away from your proton, you might end up colliding with another proton or electron that's nearby. So while there formally isn't a maximum n here, in practice there probably is, and it depends on the density of the universe. But in any case, if you take n max to be something of order 100, then u becomes 4 times 10 to the 4. So then you can ask, at what temperature would the universe have become neutral? which we'll interpret as meaning when this side of the equation is about 1. So we get that ut, which we're saying is about 4e4, over 4, which is our factor of 2 here, and a factor of 2 for u plus being a proton with two spin states, times h squared over 2 pi me kt to the 3 halves should be of order e to the minus chi over kt. And when you solve this, 
we get an answer of T being around 3,000 Kelvin. You can see this is a drastically different answer than what we first estimated of 100,000 Kelvin. And it turns out this answer, when you translate to a history of when our universe recombined, gives us a redshift of around 1,100. So it turns out in this particular case, the Saha equation governed the history of our universe.